How are you? How are you in it today? Today. I'm, I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm do, I'm doing good. I'm kidding. What do you do at the Disability Law Center? So uh, my official title at the Disability Law Center is Public Affairs Supervising Attorney. What's what's your name? What's your name? And your what you what you do? So Nate Nate Krippis, uh, and I'm the Public Affairs Supervising Attorney at the Disability Law Center. Um, I supervise our um, kind of our all of the public facing things here at the DLC. So um, I, I work with um, our communications folks doing uh, work with media and other things, um, our outreach to the public, um, the calls that come into us from the public as well. I supervise the team that takes those. Um, and I work pretty heavily with um, policymakers in the states, the state legislature uh, and others. Um, and then I kind of uh, fill in uh, as an attorney on various issues and teams, uh, but I've done a little bit of everything the, the DLC has to offer. And so um, I, I, I know how to how to tell people what's going on. That's, that's what I'm good at. Can, can you go ahead and explain, explain to us what's going on right, right, right now in, in Utah, you, Utah, how you, Utah is under investigation Investigation for sexual shelter workplaces for people that might for people that might not know what's going on. The United States Department of Justice um, sent a letter to the state of Utah uh, that say, basically said that Utah um, was violating the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and specifically a provision called Title II that covers uh, state and local governments. And under um, a, a very important ruling um, decision by the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court called Olmstead, um, it, which essentially says that um, the ADA and Olmstead say that people with disabilities have the right to um, receive services and do things and live um, in integrated settings, meaning in settings where um, they have the opportunity to interact with their non-disabled peers. Um, and so um, what the Department of Justice found was that currently the way the state is operating um, its system or a couple of different systems um, for people with intellectual disabilities who want to work, um, that they were essentially being forced into segregated settings. Um, so settings where they really didn't have opportunities to work with um, or spend time with people um, who were not like them, um, that they, they couldn't be with um, their non-disabled peer, they they were not integrated. Um, but I think the challenge is that um, that was both in employment settings where people were in um, workshop type settings that those were very segregated, um, but also sometimes people with intellectual disabilities are in day services. So um, not necessarily like an employment, but like where they spend their time during the day. And those settings also um, were not uh, uh, integrated in a way that people really had an opportunity to interact with, with their non-disabled peers. And finally, I think the other thing was that um, at an at a age um, around uh, 14, um, students should start receiving transition services in the education system. And that means that they should kind of start planning for um, employment when they, when they leave the education system. Um, and what the, the DOJ found um, for uh, people with intellectual disabilities was that essentially that uh, two agencies, um, along with uh, the State Division of Services for People with Disabilities, the Vocational Rehabilitation, which helps people with disabilities gain employment, um, and the State Board of Education, they really weren't helping people with intellectual disabilities in that process to find work. Um, essentially, that the process wasn't working such that they were just kind of assuming they couldn't work, um, leading to a problem where people uh, weren't able to find employment. Great. Thank you. Can you can you go into more de detail on your opinion your opinion on why you think um in certain workplaces they're not they're not letting those people in the certain workplaces work with with their peers like in a, a normal job. Yeah. Um, how, so I think. How, how do you how do you feel about about that? So I I think um, you know from our perspective at the DLC um, I think what what the D 
DOJ, Department of Justice or DOJ, as I'll, I'll refer to them, um, found um, is largely what I think we have seen um, over the last few years um, in our work looking at these types of settings. Um, so I think where we agree um, with the DOJ that there are problems um, within the system that are um, violations of the law, um, that ultimately um, the state has an obligation to make sure that people with disabilities are, are in integrated settings, are able to, to you know, work where they want to work and work with the people they want to work with. Um, and that opportunity has to exist. Um, and I think part of it is that there are going to be people that that will work for and there are going to be people that that won't work for. Um, but I think part of the big problem we see is that the state um, and the agencies that were, were kind of under investigation here um, are really starting with the premise that people with intellectual disabilities can't work. Um, and we just disagree with that. I think we should start with the presumption that people want to and can work um, and work to uh, see what opportunities they that are available to them to, to kind of help guide them, to provide them whatever training and support they need to get there. And if it doesn't work out, okay, um, there need to be services available available for that population too, um, day services or, or whatever that looks like. But ultimately, I think the, the presumption shouldn't start with people can't work. Um, I think another part of the problem that the DOJ found was that we the state has a very, very long waiting list for services for a lot of people with intellectual and de developmental disabilities. Um, I think the list is um, approaching 5,000 or so. Um, it's pretty long. Um, and that really is delaying. Wow. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's and and some of those people are waiting, you know, upwards of, of 20, 25 years um, to get into services. Um, and so with that, I think um, that delay is leading to some problems with people getting the support they need to find employment. Um, so I think we're we're interested to see where this goes. We're hopeful that the state will work with the DOJ to um, resolve this and make some changes to the system. In the workplace, um. According to the letter, they're only, they're only letting the the people with, with intellectual dis, disabilities only do mundane mundane tasks like shredding shredding paper and folding laundry folding laundry etc etc et and only. And only paying minimum minimum wage for for these tasks. What? Why? Why? Why do you think this, that is? So I think there are a couple of reasons. Um, uh, I think the reason um, people are only really getting opportunities for mundane tasks um, is because um, I think, as I said before, I think we start with the concept that people can't work. Um, and so they're they're forced into jobs that um, maybe don't exist elsewhere in in the the kind of the the work spectrum, um, like shredding paper by hand or tearing pages out of books or or popping you know plastic out of things. Um, you don't really see these jobs um, you know uh, across a lot of places, right? They're just jobs that we tend to 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 kind of put in these settings. Um, and I think it it starts with the idea that we don't think not we, but um, the, the state and kind of the, the, the way things are set up, um, that there's kind of a, a presumption that people can't do um, other competitive jobs, right? Competitive uh, integrated employment. Um, and so that creates this kind of this stigma. Um, and so we just kind of kind of force them into these settings. And that's what's been available for a long time. Um, I think I think some of this comes from just kind of years of having done things a certain way um, for a lot of time in history. People with disabilities were um, were also living in segregated settings, not just working there. Um, and so I think this was just kind of the way the system had been set up, um, and it, and it started with this presumption. Um, but I think the the other challenge that you're um, referring to is the payment of sometimes sub minimum wage, where people are paid even less than um, you know what minimum wage is because they have a disability, um, cents on the dollar sometimes based upon right like their what they believe you know they kind of say it's a piecemeal rate based upon what their um, productivity level is. Um, you know, I think that that is permissible under federal law. Um, the Fair Labor Standards Act uh, made that um, made that legal many, many years ago. Um, I think the reasons for that were probably um, an attempt um, in a in a past time to to make employment pot like to give employment opportunities to people with disabilities. Um, but we've come a very long way since then, and I think that 
that needs to change. I think we're hopeful that that subminimum wage as a, as a law uh, in federal law um, will go away. Uh, but ultimately, I think those those kind of those systems that have been set up um, kind of have led us to this point. Um, but I think a lot of states um, and, and other places, not maybe not a lot, um, a few other states, um, I think have made some some improvements to these systems. Um, and I think ultimately over time, um, you're seeing more and more challenges. The the DOJ, um, other organizations like ours, challenging those um, and kind of pushing to um, give people with disabilities more integrated options. Um, so I'm hopeful again that that will get there. Um, but I think it's it's really just been kind of a a, a historical problem that has led us here. Um, but ultimately, one that I think the state has an obligation to fix, and I think um, I think I I am hopeful. I, I remain hopeful today that we'll get there, but um, but we'll see uh, how things go. How do you think segregation? This segregation issue is uh, affecting people in other states with disabilities. Um, I will. I will be honest. I'm definitely not an expert on what's going on in other states. Uh, we've got plenty going on here in Utah for for us to focus on. Um, I certainly hear a little bit, um, and I I know that this is not a, a Utah problem um, alone. Um, but ultimately, I I think um, the issue of segregated employment and subminimum wage are nationwide issues. Um, I think it's employment for people with intellectual disabilities. There are still institutional settings where people with intellectual and developmental disabilities live that are very segregated. Um, the 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 population of, of folks with severe and persistent mental illness that often um, live or or kind of have services in very segregated settings nationwide, I think is is very widespread. Um, and so ultimately, I think there's um, there is no shortage of work to addressing segregation um, for for a lot of the population of people with disabilities. I think things are improving. That's why organizations like ours, um, protection and advocacy agencies exist. Um, organizations like um, the, the Institute for Disability Research Policy and Practice and, and others kind of like that around the nation. Um, we exist to kind of um, make these changes. The Department of Justice obviously is, is taking it very seriously um, here in Utah, and um, we're, not, we're not the only state where they look at these issues. So um, I think hopefully change is coming. We appreciate your, your, your time and thank you for sitting down with us today and yeah